and organizations to deliver more impact and value to their stakeholders. Um, and um, each time we have a little update from Microsoft on the Tech for Social Impact program delivered by uh, one of their partners, Ripe. Um, then we have um, a presentation from a specialist consultant supplier to the to the NFP sector, which today will be Tim O'Brien from Raffletix talking about uh, uh, fundraising methodologies. And uh, then we have Tony Burns this afternoon from Multicap, who is going to be our um, main presenter from representing the NFP sector. So um, without further ado, as we're already at the, the, the four minute mark into the session, what I might just do now is um, hand over to Patum, if you're able to um, take it away, please, Patum, with the update from, uh, from Microsoft on Tech for Social Impact. Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks, Tristan. Uh, let me bring up my slide here. Right. Can everyone see the slide? Yep, still arriving, I think. Yep. See it. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so today I would like to give you a quick overview of Microsoft newly introduced uh, security program for nonprofits. Uh, so nonprofits are increasingly at risk due to a worldwide rise in cy cybercrime. While this impact all sectors and organizations, uh, nonprofits are often perceived as vulnerable because uh, they may not have adequate resources to safeguard the data they need to operate. And impacting everyone from donors to program participants to volunteers. Um, so Microsoft 2021 Digital Defense Report confirms that in the past year, cybercrime has grown in scale and sophistication leveraging crisis to take advantage of at-risk targets. The report highlights that in the past year, NGOs and think tanks were the second most targeted sector by cyber criminals, accounting for 31% of all notifications of nation state attacks against organizational domains. These organizations are attractive targets for nation state actors because they often store sensitive data um, additionally, according to 2021 Cybersecurity Guide for Nonprofit Organizations, although cybercriminals attempt to access government and nonprofit databases every 39 seconds, uh, up to 70% of charity networks lack a comprehensive vulnerability assessment to determine risk. So, in oh, response, yeah, it's coming in now. There we go. Uh, in response to this increasing cybersecurity threat to nonprofits, Microsoft recently introduced a security program for nonprofits. So before I dive into the details, I want to let you know the QR code you see on the left hand side will take you to the main page for this program. You can either scan it uh, from your phone or actually you can click uh, from your screen as well, which will direct you to the website. Uh, and same goes for all the other links on that uh, in this pledge. You can they're all clickable, and that will uh, directly take you to the right resources. All right, let's dive in. So, as part of security program for nonprofits, there are a couple of free offerings available for organizations. Uh, first one is account guard for nonprofits. I'll discuss this in more detail as we as well as give you a quick demonstration on how to enroll in a minute. Secondly, you have uh, you can sign up for a free security assessment where they look at your environment to detect vulnerabilities and suggest where you can improve the security posture of your organization. Uh, there is also a free ebook available to download, which gives you an overview on strengthening your nonprofit uh, nonprofit's digital security. Um, and from the main screen of the website, uh, your organization can access a free cybersecurity training pathways as well. Uh, finally, I encourage you to sign up for the upcoming webinar, uh, which is shown in that last point, uh, to learn more about this security program for nonprofits. Uh, just note that the webinar is conducted in the US, so the timing might not be ideal. It's uh, in three o'clock in the morning in Australian time. 
but as long as you register uh, for uh, that webinar, you can watch it on demand afterwards. All right. Uh, so let me quickly touch on what Microsoft Account Guard for nonprofit is. Um, Microsoft Account Guard is a security service that is designed to protect highly targeted organizations from cybersecurity threats. And sadly, as I mentioned before, uh, our reporting shows that many nonprofits are targeted by these nation state actors. These nation state actors are organizations that are operating in areas of the world where local legal oversight still allows them to function. Uh, these bad cyber actors disrupt or compromise target, uh, uh, target government organizations or individuals to gain access to valuable data or intelligence and can create incidents that have international significance. Uh, specifically, Account Guard for nonprofits proactively monitors for no nation state attacks and can notify organizations if their organization, organizational or personal email accounts have been compromised. It is not a full service preemptive or protective program and is only one piece of a robust cybersecurity protective plan. Uh, and participating organizations must be a legally recognized nonprofit or non governmental organization that make, meets MIPS of nonprofit eligibility guideline and gone through the eligibility process. Um, and also, they have to be based in multiple countries where Account Guard is currently offered, which Australia and New Zealand are part of anyway. And it is worth noting that select individuals with Outlook accounts or Hotmail accounts like personal accounts can be invited to the to participate in the program as well because what microsoft has recognized is these cyber criminals tend to target uh, individual sort of personal accounts as well because they are more vulnerable and less secure so it's an easier pathway to get get to um, get to breach these uh, organizations basically um, all right, so I'll quickly show you how you can enroll into the account guard for nonprofit uh, service. Let me share my screen. Just over here. All right. Can you guys see my calendar now? <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, all right. So this is where you um, start first. You come to nonprofit.microsoft.com, which is your nonprofit. Uh, portal uh, and you sign in with your credentials, ideally the global admin tenant credentials, which will take you to the nonprofit portal. Uh, if we give it a second to load. Um, so as long as your nonprofit organization has gone through the eligibility process and has been approved, um, the, it will take you to this screen and it will say you are approved and you will be able to see all these styles here. and. Over here, you will see account guard for nonprofit style. You just click in there, and this is a free of charge service. Uh, and you can claim the offer in here. Once you click that button, you will get a notification on your email uh, saying that you are you have sort of subscribed to this service, and you can also extend that invitation to your personal emails or anyone who's working in your organization. Take you can. Uh, offer the protection for those personal emails as well. So it's just simple as that, and it's uh, free for nonprofit organizations who are eligible with the uh, Microsoft program. Um, that sort of brings into my update. Um, do you have any questions around that? You're not ripping yourself off here? No. All good? Um, no, I think that's the same. Um, the only... Um, the only thing that um, I am going to do is obviously investigate the uh, the collateral that we can present to not-for-profits. I think it's a really good initiative, and I'm sure that almost none of them know the fact that there is a free security of review out there, which is um, absolutely valuable to, uh, to to the whole sector. So we'll definitely be pushing that message out there. So thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. This was only introduced like uh, last week, actually. It's brand new. So. <laughs> Excellent. All right. OK, good stuff. Thank you very much, Patum, for the, the update on Tech for Social Impact. So Microsoft are obviously extremely active in the space and wanting to support the sector as, as well as they can globally. Um, and that's another excellent initiative, which we'll be, uh, we'll be spreading the word about very shortly. 
Um, so the um, I appreciate you um, presenting that. Now the next session is um, basically about raffle-based fundraising, uh, benchmarks, models, marketing, and realities. So um, we're going to be hearing from someone who is a total subject matter expert on this topic, uh, Tim O'Brien, who's the founder and uh, CEO of RaffleTix. So um, yeah, thank you for coming along to Tim today and sharing your wisdom. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to take the stage, please. Thank you, Tristram, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for being here. It's a, just a great opportunity to have a chat. And I have to say, for Tim, hearing that there is a free security review available for not-for-profits is absolutely brilliant. And uh, we'll certainly be mentioning that to all of our clients, which are, of course, not-for-profits. Okay, so can I just get a little show of hands? I mean, who here is well and truly for me with raffle based fundraising all right i'm hoping that some things have changed maybe over the last few years we might have something there to to introduce that that you may not have sort of thought about or considered but let's what i'm going to do is i'm going to put up a presentation is that okay there tristan if i just try and share my screen yes please okay how are we going there have we got um, have we got the big green screen up there? We have. All right. Okay, my name is Tim O'Brien. I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of RaffleTix. RaffleTix has been running since about 2017. And really, I reckon my job in this session is just to give you a, a short, sharp overview of what raffle-based fundraising looks like in 2021 and, of course, going forward 2022. So I guess we... You know, when we think about fundraising, why should a not-for-profit consider uh, raffle-based fundraising? And I reckon it's one of those go-to fundraising levers. It's such a well-understood concept for both the fundraising entity, the not-for-profit, and also the supporter, the person who's going to buy the tickets. I'm also going to go as far as to say that I reckon it's much loved entertainment particularly in an event context okay we know the charity events we expect there to be a raffle school fates raffles absolutely sporting clubs they'll run raffles community groups scout groups etc and even the big community clubs they love their raffles okay it's such a well understood concept so really i guess one of the things that i want to talk about is how in recent years, technology has changed the way that raffles can be run. Because now, of course, we are moving fair and square into an era of digital raffles. So what's a digital raffle? And why a digital raffle? Well, a digital raffle really does away with paper tickets. And it brings the entire transaction and management of the raffle into an online environment. What does it mean? Well, it means that you can extend your reach. You're not just uh, bound by that local community where you would sell your tickets. You can extend your reach just by virtue of EDMs and SMS and the like, social media, of course. Of course, in an online environment, you can see your sales data in real time. You know exactly where you are at and you can take action accordingly. It also means it improves accountability. You know who sold the tickets. You know how many tickets have been sold. You're not necessarily, you're, sorry, you're not at all chasing paper books and ticket stubs and wondering whether all the tickets are in the drawer. And of course, what we're trying to do with the digital raffle concept is improve the bottom line. Because running a raffle is just like any other business activity. You need to make a profit. Just like business, it's really simple. Ticket sales minus expenses equal the profit. I'm going to just give you a, a little case study as an example, and this is about just setting some expectations. Imagine you know, in our not-for-profit, we have a $10,000 prize pool. What would we be trying to do? What would our profit and loss, what would our budget look like? I'm just going to give, just put one up. I'm going to mock this up. This isn't actually very far from reality. 
The first thing first, $10,000 in prizes. I reckon we could set a target of 50,000 in ticket sales. Now, why would I set that target? The, the simple fact is, in Queensland, that's all you're allowed to raise if you've got a $10,000 prize pool. The most you can raise is five times the prize pool. So 10,000 in prizes. Then we've got to think about, well, look, there's some other expenses in there. You know, we're going to have to pay for some technology. We may have to pay for some clients, uh, compliance, maybe some auditing, depending on uh, um, uh, where we're at. Certainly some admin, just to pull it all together. From a marketing perspective, we may have to pay for some advertising. Social media advertising is not cheap. Uh, we may have to pay for other types of promotion. We may have to pay someone just to put together the social media campaign. So, you know, we've got to allow quite a bit to make the money. The cost of goods is going to be up there. So in that scenario, I've suggested, look, expenses are 30,000. We've sold 50,000 in tickets. We've made a $20,000 profit. Now, I'm just wondering whether that is freaking anyone out. Whether that sort of profit margin, can I, I, I can't quite see everyone here, but that is the reality. That's about where a lot of raffles end up, okay? Let's just move on to the rules of raffle. I kind of touched on one there, and, and this is where a lot of not-for-profits who are new to raffle-based fundraising just come unstuck a little bit. They're not quite sure of the rules. We have to remember that raffles are regulated. They are considered community gaming. More importantly, in a digital raffle concept where we can sell anywhere, really, we have to remember that each state and territory has its own rules. We see this a lot. A not-for-profit comes to us and says, oh, we're based in Queensland, so we just have to worry about the Queensland rules. Well, no. In fact, if you sell tickets in Victoria, you have to worry about the Victorian rules. And their rules are quite different to the Queensland rules. So we need to be aware of those rules. And, and the regulations, the rules, if you like, they typically revolve around these main areas. Firstly, how big is your prize pool? Secondly, how much are you trying to raise? What's your ticket? And, th and that often leads into what your ticket pricing and the number of tickets available uh, um, configuration. And then the final one, of course, is the type of prize. And in certain states, certain types of prizes aren't allowed or they have a limit. For example, in Queensland, if you want to offer alcohol, for example, you know, 10 consecutive uh, vintages of Penfolds Grange, you can't because the maximum you can do is $1,000 as an alcohol, as a price for a raffle. Key takeaway there, if you want to sell tickets in a particular state, you need to learn the rules. Okay. Next thing we're going to look at is the different type of models that a not-for-profit might consider uh, or might encounter, I should say, in terms of running a raffle. So let's look at the first one. The first one's the most obvious. It's the do-it-yourself model. You will source the prizes. You will source the technology. You will navigate the regulations. You will develop and execute the marketing and communications plan and you will just do it end to end, taking care of every aspect of the raffle. Most of our clients that, that run raffles uh, on the Raffle platform, this is the, the scenario. Anyone who's run a charity, been involved in a charity, knows a very other common type of model, and that is the supporter driven model. And that is where a supporter comes and says, look, we love what you do. We love your business. We love your, your cause. We want to raise funds for you. Key takeaway here is they're bound by the same rules as the charity and any other not-for-profit. So the, this is a, a management scenario where the not-for-profit needs to manage that supporter. And of course, the supporter needs to have a letter of authority from the charity. They must abide by the regulations. There's a rule in most states which says that supporter must deliver at least 30 to 40, I think it's, it depends on the type of raffle and depends on the, uh, the state, 30 to 40% of gross ticket sales must end up with the, with the beneficiary, the charity, if you like. Of course, in this scenario, the supporter takes the risk. I'm going to tell you about this one here. This was a wonderful um, furniture maker in uh, the Byron Bay area. He put up one of his custom pieces 
He was the prize supplier. This is almost the best case scenario. He was the prize supplier. He had a huge audience, a huge social media audience. The other scenario is he might, you know, this sort of person, this type of supporter may have, may run a large event. But in this case, this particular supporter who was putting up this beautiful piece of furniture to raffle, he had a very large social media audience and that was a very successful raffle. The next type of raffle, of course, is where a charity, for example, might simply outsource the whole lot to a marketing company. And this is where, if you like, it's a raffle as a service. The charity, the beneficiary will still need to lodge the permits. In this scenario, a minimum of 30%, this is typically a major raffle, a, you know, a large scale raffle, a minimum of 30% of gross ticket sales must go to the beneficiary. That's actually a law, that's a regulation in New South Wales, and that kind of drives a lot of the other states. Of course, this scenario requires commercial agreements. The absolute best scenario in this sort of model is that the marketing company is unbelievably good at digital marketing and has a large audience. Okay. One last model I want to talk about because I think this has got enormous legs. This is what I call a group raffle. This one here is the Toyota Good for Footy raffle you can see on the screen. This is a scenario where there's one raffle and loads of beneficiaries, loads of football clubs in this case were acting as sales agents. They were selling tickets in the raffle. Now, what was special about this type of raffle is that the, the, the sponsor, which in this case would happen to be Toyota, they put up three cars. Um, uh, look, there was a whole bunch of other prizes, probably about $180,000 worth of prizes that they put up. And what it meant was that around about 500 local footy clubs were able to go out and promote this raffle, sell tickets in this raffle. They were able to leverage their member databases, their, their um, email, their SMS, their social media to their fans and to their supporters and just members, the, the players, etc. And they sold that raffle out about a week before time at five times the prize pool. Now, we have subsequently seen other scenarios where uh, Scouts Victoria has done the same sort of thing for about 400 scout groups in Victoria and New South Wales. There's a real potential with this type of model for any, any sector, if you like, any industry that has, or association, that has a lot of member clubs or member organisations under it. Okay, I'm going to give you a super quick uh, overview, I guess, of what does it take to promote a raffle? I mentioned that five times prize pool, you know, Toyota Good for Footy raffle, $180,000 worth of prizes, $900,000 raise. It's achievable, but it's difficult. Most of our the, the raffles that we see, I reckon are three times prize pools, good going. A 30 to 40% profit margin, 40%, you know, that's probably good going. You just have to be realistic. The number one thing I'm saying to any not-for-profit is focus on your mailing lists, okay? Focus on your direct email and SMS lists. Your CRM system, what's in those systems are, is gold. Social media, organic social media is really important, an important touch point from a raffle perspective you do require a large audience for it to be effective and to get that organic sharing happening. I'm going to have to tell you everyone here, this is a reality check. Social media advertising is troublesome, okay? It is fraught. Um, it, uh, we're seeing and it, that it's becoming increasingly ineffective for this sector. We know that Google advertising is ineffective and, and we've known that for a while. And it all comes back to having those mailing list where you have the direct connection with the end user with the when i say end user with, with, with the supporter okay last couple of thoughts and these i'm going to leave you with these thoughts if you have a plan to do raffle based fundraising give yourself enough time to plan the campaign and and to get it right and to to think about the sort of the ins and outs and the realities and give yourself enough time to conduct the campaign even if it's an event 
base raffle, a big charity ball or something like that. Give yourself enough time um, in the lead up to sell tickets to make sure you've got a nice base of sales before you actually get there. Also, people will know that it's on. Okay, so always give yourself enough time. And we notice that people do, I guess, um, underestimate the, the time needed. Okay, thank you all. I just wanted to give you that, that overview of the sort of the raffle landscape. I really appreciate your time. I'm gonna stop sharing. And of course, I'm not sure what the next process there is, Tristram, but uh, I'm happy to take questions or if we do that in a breakout room, that's completely up to you. No, look, uh, thank you so much, Tim. It's it's not um, a really, you know, sort of we'll save questions um, for another forum. It's that this is the ideal time. Um, that's really interesting. You know, the, the, the nuances of of running a, a raffle and all the rules. And I, you know, I understood at a high level that there are differences between the states. But um, but, you know, it's it's obviously pretty fraught. And, you know, the, the rules around particular types of prizes and so on do make it quite complicated. So. So what, what is the, um, the common sort of stuff that you see where people run into problems? I'll give you an example. It happened last week. Major corporate wanted to do a special event. They wanted to run a raffle to benefit a charity. The main audience, sorry, the charity was based in Victoria. The main audience was going to be in Victoria. They said, can we get up and running this week for the event that's next week? And I just said, no that you can't because the charity, the beneficiary, they weren't registered as a community and charitable organization in Victoria. They hadn't um, given their bona fides to the VCGLR, the Victorian Commission of Gambling and Liquor Regulation. So they weren't allowed to receive uh, the, the proceeds of a, of a raffle. So that immediately just knocked them out. But secondly, they left it too late to plan that corporate. And, you know, there was some money involved. I mean, they had some really decent prizes. I'm going to tell you it was involved in, in uh, it, you know, in um, hospitality. And I would have liked, liked to have won those prizes. And I think the event was going to be brilliant. OK, but they couldn't, they weren't able to execute that. And we had to explain that. Look, next time, give yourself some time. Yeah, it's really interesting. Does anyone have, else have any questions for Tim? No, Tim, okay. oh. I've got a quick question, uh, Tristan. Um, Tim, what's the biggest, um, I guess, uh, you know, this information is so valuable. Thanks for, for sharing it. What is the biggest uh, mistake that not-for-profits are making in this space? And what's the one advice that you could give us um, going forward to, um, you know, get a better outcome? More and more, I'm seeing this and I have to sit some people down or we have to sit some people down and explain, don't rely on Facebook or social media. It's not your friend in this in this case. Your friend is to build the biggest mailing list and to be, you know, the rap, the whole raffle just conversation that you have with that mailing list, it's not every five minutes, you know, you're not pinging them every five minutes. It's part of that conversation, that regular conversation that you're having. And um, so I, I just really, you know, I think this is where, you know, that whole CRM system that comes in, you know, that need to build up and understand how important that those contacts are and that list um, for, and, and also the regularity, you know, having that regularity of communications that go out. And if, if the raffle ask is one of those um, communications, you know, that's a fabulous thing. You'll have, you'll have better results. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tim, for sharing your um, experience and expertise on the topic. Uh, do we have any other questions for Tim before we wrap up? No, well, I would just make the, the comment that obviously, you know, a CRM, a list of, of um, people that you can contact is, is critically important if you want to start um, fundraising really for every um nfp and you know there are some options available from microsoft through the tech for social impact program so as a registered nfp you are able to get five free licenses for dynamic 365 crm and there are some plugins that are available too that are free of charge um there is some requirements uh, for setting it up and configuring it so that it does what you want to reflect your organization 
but um, there are models, uh, modules rather for CRM, such as fundraising and engagement, which is another free module. There's there's a thing called the not-for-profit accelerator, which allows you to customize um, your CRM to, to reflect your own requirements. So Microsoft can really help with that, building a CRM, and, uh, and we can certainly give advice if anyone needs it. But um, yeah, look, thank you so much, Tim. I think you've made some excellent points and uh, and uh, woken people up to some of the, the, not only the possibilities, but also the pitfalls of, um, of uh, you know, trying to run raffles without knowing the rules. So that's been excellent. Absolutely welcome, Trisha. Thank you. So um, yeah, look, uh, we, we um, have another presentation now, which about finding your key purpose, which is very relevant to the sector. And I'm sure all of us turning up here have uh, have asked ourselves that question on more than one occasion about what it is that we're really passionate and driven about. Um, so the the topic here is about um, you know the the force that drives every area of your life. It really is. You know, if you understand your key purpose, it's really easy to keep on track. Um, and um, yeah, understanding it helps to shape your beliefs and, and how you can change them. So um, to present this session, I'd really like to welcome Tony Burns, the General Manager for Employment at Multicap. So thank you for your uh, donation of time again, Tony. And uh, yeah, please take it away when you're ready. Awesome, Tristan. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for today's opportunity and, and welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to also just acknowledge and thank um, Patham for his uh, his initial um, information about Microsoft. Thank you for that, and um, and also for uh, Tristan and, and Olivia for for um, organising and putting this event on today. I think it's great to put um, like-minded people in the room and uh, always get something. Um, I'm always a big believer if you're going to spend time on Teams or with a meeting, always try and learn one thing or or move away with something great. So, Tim, thanks for your uh, presentation on on raffle tickets. I've actually had a lot of experience with my background, which I'll talk in a second, which um, your advice is very valuable. And I think um, that the platform of that space is changing. So um, thank you for your advice. That was really great. All right, so I'm just going to share my screen. And Has everyone had a good Wednesday? Yeah, it's been pretty good so far, I have to say. Okay. Just loading up now, so hopefully, just let me know, Tristan, when it comes online. Sure, will do. Haven't seen it yet. Come out now. Ah, it's on its way. Yes. Should be there now. Is that right? Um, yep. I think it's. Uh, I think it's showing. I've got a little bit of a lag. I'm on a home internet connection today, which is a bit slow. But I think everyone else is giving a nod, so I think Excellent. we're good. Right. So um, today's um, opportunity, obviously, is um, really about sort of finding a key purpose and. I guess one of the most things I like to open up is um, very, very few people and very, very few organisations can clearly state why they do what they do. And by why I don't mean to make money, that's a result. By why I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organisation exist? And why do you get out of bed in the morning? That's something that's driven me very, very early on and uh, I want to take you guys on a bit of a journey. So can you see that next slide, Tristan? Yep, certainly can. Perfect. So the two most important days in life. Um, hands up if you think when the day you're born is um, an important day. Yeah. But the day you find out your why, now that's, that's the key. So I'm just going to play a little video here. Take you on a bit more of a journey. I do not believe that any of us have dreams that were not given to us for the purpose of accomplishing those particular dreams.
If you feel you have something to give, if you feel that your particular talent is worth developing, is worth caring for, then there's nothing you can't achieve. So I applaud you for your dreaming, for your running toward your dream. I applaud you for believing in yourself because that's what life is about, stretching and challenging, looking for ways that you can begin to improve yourself. Not only is it possible for you to have your dream, but it's necessary, it's necessary that you go for what is yours in the universe. Logical, practical thinking says you can't do it today. But if you want to produce unreasonable results in your life, like living your dream and taking charge of your destiny, you've got to be an unreasonable person. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is. Your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact. Everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. If it's hard, why do people do it? Why do they go? People who climb mountains. Why would a Nelson Mandela give up 26 years of his life? Why do people do that? Even though it's hard, it's worth it. It's worth it. The people who go after their stuff, what makes it worth it? It's got to be your passion. You got to love it. It's got to be what you are supposed to do. You do what it is you're supposed to. You're supposed to build something. You're supposed to create something. I don't know how to do it. Learn. Let me share something with you. History is being read, but it's also being written by people with imagination. Don't stop! Don't stop! Don't stop running towards your dream! Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. No matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. Live your life with passion with some drive. Hands up if you enjoyed the video. I might open up quickly, just um, Tristan, if you, uh, what did, what does someone enjoy about it? If they can just open up and put your hand up and put, take you off mic and just tell me something about it that you enjoyed. Yeah, well, um, I'll go first. Um, I, I think it's always, really important to understand you know um your, your purpose and what you're aiming for it's easy to get going uh when things are tough if you have something bigger than you know just the moment or the the the, the you know the simple goal that you're aiming for at the time if you have an overarching purpose it really helps you to uh to keep motivated through the tough times yeah absolutely and i think we've got another hand up there too we do. Um, I can't see who that is at the moment. I'm just trying to open up the um, the screen. So does anyone else want to take themselves off mute and make a comment? Please just go ahead. Go, Tim. Guys, am I off mute? Yes. OK. Um, Tony, I've got a 14-year-old son, and there was a, a little image there of a young guy on the, on the train looking a bit despondent. Um, probably underestimating his, you know, value, his worth, his potential, etc. It was a little reminder to me to, um, you know, sometimes we've got to pick people up, don't we, as well, yeah. and give them a give them a bigger picture to aim for. It's a great point, Tim, and I think you know one of the biggest things that um, you know we're the most um, connected species in the world, but we're also the most disconnected. And we're always on our phones and we're always trying to connect through this. But I think about having conversations and, and reaching out to people and giving them a, 
you know, um, that confidence, like your son, you know, that, you know, reach for the stars and anything's possible. Um, I was very lucky enough to have great parents who instilled that in me. And uh, that segue right now, you'll see on your screen, there's a picture of um, myself on a newspaper. So I just wanted to clarify a few things of my credibility today. So I'm um, currently the uh, NT champion for rock, paper, scissors. Um, I, um, in 2010, won the competition and they uh, flew me down to Canberra on the day that Julie Gillard became prime minister. And um, they never held the competition again. So I, um, I'm still the NT champion. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll just, next slide. Can you hear me? Yes. How do you win at Rock, Paper, Scissors? Yeah, great, great question. So <laughs> they actually had this, it's, it's um, you've got to believe in yourself a lot, Olivia. Um, I watched a lot of Star Wars, so I, I was gifted to have the force. Um, look, it's a bit of a numbers game. Um, to be honest with you, it's, it was incredible. They, they've got, a, there's an actual international championships for Rock, Paper, Scissors. So I lost in the quarterfinals and then they flew the person from Australia across to Canada for the world championship. So um, maybe I'll take you offline and I'll give you some extra tips on how to, to win. But um, anyway, it's a bit of a, yeah, <laughs> it's a talent to it. So. <laughs> um, so a bit of homework for you guys. So on the 17th of July, 1995, my life changed um, incredibly. You know when you have those sliding door moments in your life? Um, and I watched this movie called Rudy. Now, Rudy was based on a college football player in America. Are there any people in the room that have seen the movie Rudy? All right, so do me a favor, a bit of homework. Write down on a piece of paper for me. R-U-D-Y, part of a hero. Come on, Olivia. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a fantastic movie. So I watched it back in 95. I was so inspired by this movie that I went into my parents' bedroom and I said, I'm going to meet this guy one day. And um, I was actually playing professional tennis at the time. And uh, three and a half years later, I tracked the real guy down and had lunch with him in Las Vegas. Um, the actual guy from the true story, not the actor. Um, but it, if you want to just, it's it's an incredible movie. Now, I don't think that, you know, you probably watch it. You won't go out and try and track him down too. But I wanted to tell that story is because it played a massive part in my why and what I'm doing now. Um, so when I was coming back from America, I saw a guy called John McLean. Now, John is in this picture here. Um, he's got an incredible um, story and background. So John was the first person to do the Hawaiian Ironman in a wheelchair. Um, now, if people don't know what an Ironman race is, it's a 3.8 K swim, 180 K bike ride and a marathon all in one go. I was coming back from America and I saw this documentary on John and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be fantastic to meet him one day? And um, a couple of years later on the Sunshine Coast, I um, saw John at the corner of my eye after a Noosa triathlon. And I thought, well, wow, you know, um, you know, when you have those sliding door moments where you can either take action on it, or you can sit back and not take action. Who's who's done that before? You know, when you're sort of sitting in that moment and you think to yourself, you know what, um, oh no, that's not probably, that's not John, I'll just I'll just keep continue dinner. So I went up to John, I literally had three minutes to, to speak with him, and I told him, look, thank you so much for all his inspiration. And I told him about the movie Rudy. So the thing about connecting with people is about really finding what your why is and then connecting authentically with that person. I didn't realize at the time, but John was actually being um, training to be the first person in the world to swim across the English Channel. Now, John was hit by an eight ton truck in 2000, uh, 1988. He was training for the Nepean Triathlon and an eight ton truck um, ran him over. He, um, he died three times on the table in hospital. Um, and some other homework for you, please, if you can, write down John McLean, 60 Minutes. Um, it's a huge, it's on YouTube. It is an incredible story. Um, now, keep in mind, I wanted to meet John. I didn't realize at the time he was attempting to do this race. Nike gave him $20,000 and John loved my passion. So he said, look, I want you to be, um, I want to be part of my foundation. So 
in 2004, I did my first Ironman race um, with John. And um, since then, I've done five Ironman races and a few crazy 100, 100 um, ultra marathons. Um, I've been able to personally raise over three quarter million dollars for his foundation. Um, and I wanted to tell you that part of the story because it links into the rest of um, the passion of what we're doing now. So you'll see here on your screen, um, and you're probably thinking, how come John is walking? So what I did was I went across to Egypt in 2012 and I was raising money for a young girl who had muscular atrophy in Darwin. And um, it was the day that um, Egypt was under attack. And I don't know, hands up if you've eaten a bad kebab before. Out on the, you know, uh, and it, not the best thing in Egypt. So um, I actually got Guardia. And um, I've been training for 12 months for this 100 kilometer ultra marathon race. Um, and I was on the toilet for 12 hours, uh, 24 hours. Anyway, long story short, I, I, I did the race. Um, I was pulled off at 70K mark. Um, Egypt was under attack. Um, I came back to Australia safely, thank goodness. And then 12 months later, I created my own 100 kilometer race and I called it Croc to Croc. Um, you can Google that. It's a pretty cool story with what we did and raise money. But I wanted to show you this part of the stories because John met me at the 99K mark after I'd been running for 15 and a half hours. And John walked unassisted for the first time in 25 years um, and did the last kilometre with me. So some homework for you guys. Check out the 60-minute story on John. I guarantee you it will be one of the most inspiring things that you'll ever see. Um, so getting on to today's talk to about really about passion and purpose. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, you know, finding out what your true why is, um, how you can adapt that to your, your own life, um, really about bringing success to along that journey and bringing everyone along it, which is important. And also, I think importantly, too, is we've got to remember to smile transform your brand. I think it was important, like what Tim was saying, you've got to continue to think differently. Um, I spoke to Tristan about this as well. You know, as society and as organizations, you've got to continue to think differently and be, um, why does people want to connect with your brand? Um, so that's a really important thing that um, hopefully today you'll get a couple ideas out of. So I, um, I as Tristan said, I'm the general manager of employment um, at Multicap. Um, Multicap is an incredible organization that's been going since 1962. Um, and as you see on screen there, we predominantly focus on inspiring and empower people with special needs and disabilities. Um, we're very focused on um, a strategic plan for our organization, which is made up of four different categories. Um, delighted customers, skilled workforce, service excellence, and sustainable growth. And I'm thinking, you know, around those four categories there, Anyone in business, if you keep it simple like that, you can actually achieve some fantastic results. Um, obviously for us too, you've got to have a mission and really why you get out of bed in the morning. So our mission is to assist people with disabilities to achieve their full potential. Um, the vision for the organization is to inspire confidence, independence and life skills. And then also our objectives is to be a committed and innovative employer um, and really focus on, you know, possibilities, not disabilities. So we're based in Queensland and sort of the top of New South Wales, but it's really about brand strategy. And that's what I want to talk about today is about every person and not for profit or like I like to call it these days for purpose. Um, some other homework from this point onwards, I give you an opportunity, guys, to actually say to yourselves, we're not a not-for-profit. We actually are a for-purpose because you cannot actually run a business without making a profit. And I don't like the analogy of not-for-profit. Um, I changed those words very um, many, many years ago when I ran a company in the Territory um, called Helping People Achieve. And um, we transformed that business. Um, we're lucky enough to win the Telstra Business of Year Awards and was the first charity in Australia to do that. And that was really about transforming the brand. Um, so I guess one of the things I'd like you to think about today is how is your brand strategy going for your organization? Has it been looked upon for some time? Is there an opportunity that you can actually look at it and go, well, how can we actually improve our strategy and our sort of our connection with our customers? 
So for us, and, and as we continue to grow and, and evolve as leaders and as um, great purpose-driven organisations, I think it's really important that you focus on a few key things. So the first one really is about your target audience um, and about where you're really going um, and revisiting sort of what your purpose is, um, how you're going to connect with your customers. And I think what, what, um, what Tim said before in his presentation, it's about being authentic. You can't rely on Facebook or Google or social media these days. That's a platform to push a message, but really it gets back to that connection of that face-to-face -face or even that personal connection on why that business or why that company should do business with you. Um, and really for today, I guess, brands are turning to really for purpose. They're realising that traditional marketing methods and approaches are less effective today. Um, hands up if you think that's true. Yep. And you'll see it in all the advertising and all the marketing that people are doing. You know, brands are turning to purpose as they realise that traditional marketing methods and approaches are less effective. So what consumers are really looking for are searching for brands and companies and people that have a meaningful and authentic contribution to their lives and their society. Um, if you get a chance to Google uh, Charity Water, they're an incredible company that, similar to what's done in the past with, um, you know, Thank You Water in Australia, but they're doing some fantastic stuff around the world. So they've got some really great ideas on how they do their business too. So I think another thing about um, today's presentation I want to make a big point about is we need to be as we have to be authenticity, you know, hands up if you've dealt with businesses before where they're not authentic. Anybody? It's not the best experience, is it? You know, you come away feeling, well, I'm not really believing what they're doing. You know, for us, it was very clear. We wanted to change a whole culture, but the purpose driven for myself is about not only transforming our sector, but we're communicating and transforming society as well. And that's what drives me to get out of bed in the morning. So for us, it was really about what is our brand strategy? It has to be real. You know, we have to be true to ourselves. Every single day we get out of bed, there's a purpose of what we're doing. Um, there has to be equity in it from all parts. So if you've got a transaction with somebody, the equity has to be there for both parties or all parties. Um, it's very important to be transparent. I think a lot of these days as human beings, we get so busy in the doing that we forget to be transparent with, you know, really enjoying the moment and also being vulnerable enough to actually say, how can we do this better? And you've got to trust in the process. I think importantly, um, you know, for us, it's about going forward and, and making sure that we can, we can do things and trust that we're heading in the right direction. Um, so for us, it's really about having clear vision. Um, you know, for organisations, um, and I think in the not-for-profit, for-purpose world, you need to have vision. And I think, you know, our sector is an incredible sector. And I, uh, I want to compliment Tristan again for giving this platform for organisations to really be connected with great people because you never know when that one conversation is going to go from going from a conversation to a partnership. Um, you know, for us, it was really important um, for us to have a model around employment. Obviously, I'm the general manager for employment, so we're actually going through a process at the moment to have really clear, defined um, pathways towards going and making a big difference for our organisation. But where that comes from is being truly inspired and making sure that um, in my division, we, uh, we employ uh, 156 amazing people, but every single day, it's so important that we continue to ask our team and our, and our partners, you know, are we inspired by what we're doing? How can we do it better? And continually to ask that question, you know, what is next? And, and I always say to my team, if we are a better organization than we were yesterday, then we're on the right track. Um, in our model in enterprises, we've got um, multiple business lines that fall under employment. So our whole focus is about focusing on possibilities, not disabilities. But you'll see there on screen, we've got a list of different companies. 
each one of those businesses um, are separate to the overall arm um, of employment. So they've got their own profit margins and, and profit and loss statements and, and they run as a normal business. Um, but for us, it was really important to think, how can we be different to our market space? So I want to talk about three examples today that um, really started with a conversation that led on to greatness for our company. So on the screen there, you'll see there's um, four pictures. On the left down on the bottom line, there's one there with Laundretto with two of our amazing staff members. We actually ran um, um, a Laundretto, which was sort of like a public laundry um, that wasn't making much money. What happened was we had a conversation with a company called One Harvest. Now, One Harvest is an organization that packs all the um, salads. They got 90% of uh, market share in Coles, Woolworths and Audi around Australia. And they pack all the packs of lettuces and stuff in the, you buy from the shops. Um, so they had actually getting their, um, all their staff, which is over 500 staff, they needed to get all this, um, the laundry done. So what happened was we turned that laundry that was making a, a loss into um, a commercial laundry, um, which was a really great story because what happened was we turned it from employing one person with a disability to now having 15 people with all abilities employed, um, a business that's making a contribution, but we're also changing the way that people look upon that word disability. So I guess one of the things I want to leave with you with this today from that example is what is a what is something in your business that you're doing currently that, you know, having a conversation with another business can transform that partnership? Because what you need to do is if you find a pain point in a company, there might be something in your business market that you can actually transform and build a great relationship. Um, that One Harvest partnership then turned into a call center. So all our people now are actually making the calls for One Harvest to actually call up all the, the shopping centers around Australia to order their um, their salads. And then we've actually just um, actually about to launch next week. Um, it's a, coal, a food, process, food processing plant. So you'll see up on the, the top left hand corner, there's some green chairs. We're actually going to be cutting the snow peas. Um, for this organization. So I wanted to inspire you in some sense in that is that you never know where that relationship can come from, um, from one step to a next step, you know, and then before you know it, you've got three brand new enterprises making a massive contribution to your business line. Um, on screen, you'll see there's two incredible people, um, Alex and Jeffrey. They, um, they're incredible people that have got all abilities. Um, we've just partnered with Cook Medical. Now, Cook Medical is a multi, multi-billion dollar company from America. Um, they specialise in, in um, making stents for doctors. They've got 98% market share in the world. The reason I want to tell you about this example is that, once again, it's about really reaching out and just knocking on that door to that company and going, how can we help? Um, basically, what happens is we're in, they're actually employing these two gentlemen down at their their organisation um, on a full time basis now. So they were working for Multicap, they've left Multicap and now working full time for this company. Um, we've got a job coach down there helping them, but that's real employment with a multi billion dollar company. So I just want you guys to think too that you know outside of your um, your connections and your customers, when was the last time that you asked the question? What's your pain point at the moment? And there might be something in your business model that you could help out. And then I've um, got something really excited to look, talk about is um, our partnership with um, a company that you might have heard of, PepsiCo. Now, PepsiCo, as you probably would have heard, has been around for a little while. Um, another multi-billion dollar company. Um, we've actually just signed the first agreement in Australia um, of its kind to employ um, our incredible staff members to pack all the Red Rock uh, chips in um, in Coles and Woolworths. So next time you go past and you see the Red Rock chips, you can sort of say, okay, I know I know a company that packs those. Um, so that's real meaningful employment um, and that partnership potentially, if we hit our targets, are going to um, 
increase and employ 200 people with all abilities within two years. Um, so I wanted to explain and, and just expire that because it's um, we're really proud of that opportunities. Um, and it comes back to, as you'll see there, transforming the way that you think about your business model. Um, we all have that opportunity every single day to think, what are we doing now? Where do we want to head to in a short period of time? But what can we do with just really having different conversations, but also maybe just flipping that one arm of the business, which can totally transform your next um, your next arm of the business. So, um, yeah, so look, love to reach out. And if there's an opportunity after this, please reach out to me if you've got any questions. Um, our whole focus here is about really about, you know, finding purposeful jobs for people who really, um, you know, deserve to be um, included in society. I have, and I've said this to Tristram, I have the most passionate workforce in the world. Um, if anyone's in Brisbane online, please reach out. I'd love to come and show you what we do on the ground because um, I tell people every day you come, if you come and visit Multicap for the first time, you'll be inspired by what our guys do. And I guess in closing, I'd like to leave this is every act of kindness creates a ripple with no end. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, congratulations on what you guys are doing in this space. You know, um, I think it's really important to really connect with your team members and continue to ask the question and make sure that everyone's on the same why. Um, I think also, you know, it's time to actually keep and smell the roses too. There's so much media out there with COVID and everything happening in the moment that I think we just got to continue to think about the great things of why we do what we do every single day and go to work and make a difference. Um, and if you can inspire one person to become greater, then um, that's a good thing. So hope you enjoyed today. Check out those videos. Rudy, I want to report by next Monday on how you enjoyed the movie. Um, but please, it's a fantastic story. Um, he lives in Las Vegas, so if you want to go there and meet him, he's still there. But um, I hope you enjoyed today. Tristan, thanks for the opportunity, and um, I hope you guys um, enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much, Tony. Really appreciate that. Um, that was an excellent presentation. Um, and uh, I've certainly got some comments and questions, but before I go there, um, I'd love to throw it out to the floor. So uh, would anyone like to uh, make comment or, uh, or ask questions of Tony while we have him? Don't be shy, guys. Hi, Tony. It's Melissa here. Hey, Melissa. Um, so I work with small business owners and their people, so very much from the HR headache, people paracetamol approach. Um, yep. I just wanted to see with this rumour um, as to whether it's going to happen of the great resignation when it comes to businesses, do you think that that's going to be a bit of a turning point for your business to offer solutions to fill some of those gaps? 100%, 100%. I think, um, and that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I think we're at a point in time now in, in, in our life of the business world is things can be dramatically changed and it's about transforming the way that, you know, every single business is doing things. Um, and you cannot unfortunately continue to go down the pathway you've done because if you do that, you'll get lost, but you'll get, you'll get, you know, you'll get taken over. Um, so I think really what we're trying to do as a model is continuing to ask the question on, how we can support and, and partner with businesses. Um, and when there's pain points out there, like I said, it's really about stretching yourself and being nimble enough and vulnerable enough as an organization to ask the question. Because the reality of it is, there's still a stigma out there of the word disability. But if you can transform that and change that, I had a conversation the other day with an organization that we've been lucky enough to partner with they are blown away. You know, they're um, quite a large organisation, but they've said to us, thank you for taking us on this journey because nine times out of 10, it's not as hard as it, it seems. And I think if you take that approach, um, you never know where you can head with that. So um, there's opportunity out there. It's just a matter of if you, if you grab it by two hands and, and ask the question. And how do businesses connect with you to do that? Because I'd like to connect. Yeah, absolutely. So with you. What I'll do after this, I'll ask Tristan to um, 
just get the email addresses of all of you guys. And what I'll do is I'll send out a little um, information pack and my details. And yeah, love to um, love to chat offline. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Joe, you got your hand up. Hi, thank you so much. That's um, it's always great to. I mean, the impact place for me is a really great touchstone. So thank you, Tristram, again um, for hosting and getting some some great speakers on. Thank you, Tony, and thank you, Tim. Um, I just wanted to also say something that came up um, during your presentation, Tony, was you know uh, so much more now in the marketplace. Uh, customers are becoming more um, aware and um, uh, I, I guess savvy about the authenticity of who they're buying from and what they're buying as our clients as well. Um, but coming from the same space as Melissa, um, the HR space and, and helping people find their, 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 their work home, I guess, their new work home. Um, can you give some strategies? You've obviously been very successful in finding your why and distilling sort of what is important to you and, and directing that in a really effective way in, in, in finding employment. So often that I find with um, when talking to um, candidates about what their why is, they find it very difficult to then apply that to um, a money making um, uh, no, employment, yeah. I guess. So. It, is there any strategies that you have, any tips or tricks that you could share with us that, that you've been able to do it so effectively yourself? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And it's um, it's an interesting one. And I think when I opened up the, when I opened it up about the conversation around the Simon Sinek um, quote around about very, very few people and very few organisations don't know what their why is. Um, and that's why it's so important now more than ever that if you don't have the right people in your organization um, who are truly committed to what you're trying to do, um, you're wasting your time. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so there's two parts to that. Sometimes people need to be taken on the journey and really committed to about why, making it very clear about what your why is. Um, my why has been quite a journey. So as you can see, why I told you about the John McLean Foundation and all that stuff at the start was it's linked to this point now with what I'm doing and inspiring not only for our organization, but like Melissa said, um, it's that bigger why too about connecting with the community and connecting with and educating people. So I think one of the things that I've found that's worked really well with me, Joanna, is really making it very simple. Like whatever that why is for your organization, it's got to have meaningful and it's got to be authentic and it's got to have real connection to what your brand is. If it's not, then people aren't going to believe in it. But if you can actually make that really simple and and it's believable. So if people believe in what you're saying, then then greatness will come. It's like that conversation with the PepsiCo I talked about or One Harvest. If they didn't believe in what we we're doing, that conversation wouldn't unfold to where it is now. Um, so I think one of the good things that you can say in, in like in a HR training purposes is really stripping it back to that point of why you guys are in business. Why is your organization doing what it is doing? And if you've got the right people in the right place as the chessboard game um, and everyone, are, everyone comes to work believing that they're here for a purpose, um, nine times out of ten, you'll get so much further than just having people that come here for a paycheck. Um, and another thing that you might help to, I know I pushed it a few times and I should get shares in the company, but watch Rudy because I guarantee you when you watch that movie, the simplicity of that message is so powerful because when you're on the right train track, when it's hard and you're going through and you don't believe that you're on, you're going, it's getting back to that why and once you watch that movie i guarantee you um and that will help your staff as well if you get a chance to promote it as well thank you tony tim do you look like you were going to say something um i'm not sure if you had a question or comment um, um. yeah look I, i'm a numbers man tristram you know that and um uh Tony, I just wonder if you can give me or give us all a sense of, of the multi-cap sort of throughput. I don't mean to use it like that, but, you know, just the number of people that 
that uh, you're involved in and assisting yep. and, and a place in, I guess? No, no, great question, Tim. Thank you. So Multicap started up in 1962 with five families and back in 62, um, you know, the language wasn't great. Um, you know, families with spastics and, you know, the whole, the whole analogy of where it's come from has been quite a journey for us. Um, so started with five families with a vision and a dream. Um, as of today, we employ um, over 1,600 people across multiple business arms. Um, so in, um, in, I guess, in housing, wellbeing, and in employment. So um, I guess, and we've got hubs as well, like, um, and also, I guess, from my point of view, we're transforming the way that employment is looked upon because really getting back to people with all abilities, all they want to do is make a contribution. And I think one of the great things that we've been able to do very early on in the last sort of six months is transform the why of what we do. So as I said to you, we employ 156 people in employment, um, but across the board, we've got 1,600 staff um, in multiple sort of a range of areas. But I think at the end of the day, one of the biggest things I love to do, Tim, is continue to actually educate the wider audience about the word disability and about possibilities because whenever you have those conversations with people it, you never know where that can lead um, so as i said I'd, I'd love to reach out to you guys after this and if there's anything in your business that we can assist with um, or put you in the right direction as well um, i sit on the national board for nds which is for supported employment so i've got other organizations around australia who can assist if you've got other locations so more than happy to that, but from a Queensland base, um, would love to have a question, have a chat with all of you offline because, like I said, um, a lot of the time, I'll give you an example. So I was at this talk a few months ago, and we had all these big CEOs and organisations online talking about the future of, you know, um, global globalisation and um, the business market, and I had. A microphone and I asked the question to all these highly successful CEOs and, and business owners um, in government and, and, and organizations and I asked the question thank you so much for your talk today but I said what is your position on employing a person with disability and the place went completely quiet they were like deers with high lights in their eyes so I think there's a lot of um, area to continue to do in this space but if we can continue to ask the hard questions and be vulnerable enough to think, why can't I be open to this conversation? Um, a lot of the time, our partners that have come on this journey with us, um, it's been an incredible journey, which they thought they could never be on. Thank you for that, Tony. And um, Yoli, I'm sure this is fairly close to your heart too, being a social enterprise aficionado and um, seeing what Tony's been talking about with all these different businesses that have spun off from Multicap as a way of self-funding effectively, which is um, really, um, really, you know, it's exactly in your wheelhouse, I guess. Have you got any comments or questions? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, Tony, I, I agree with what Tristram's saying, and thank you very much for your presentation. And I've actually been doing some work with a couple of um, uh, organisations that are social enterprises that are actually looking at similar sort of things. One that's working with people with disabilities at Caboolture and engaging them more in running the organisation and having greater uh, ownership of the organisation. And the other is um, looking at how um, families can run businesses with their person with, an, with all abilities. And we're exploring those business models from a social enterprise perspective. And what you're talking about is definitely social enterprise, uh, where, at, it, it, or you, as, you, as you probably indicated, that they're businesses that contribute the funds to your not-for-profit. Can I just ask, are those businesses um, that you're running, are they set up as proprietary limited companies where a percentage of the money goes back to multi-cap meadows or is it a different legal structure? 
No, no. So they're um, they're trading names, and yeah. it all basically falls into employment as a as an arm of the business. Oh, then, right. Which then goes back into the business of um, the overall success of the company. So, look, um, and it's quite an interesting space because, as you can imagine, and I say this to people too, when they tell me about you know, running a business or a small business, it's quite difficult. But when you put the complexities in it, when you're actually employing some incredible people with all abilities, that puts mm. another facet on it, which is quite challenging. But that's one thing that drives me. And I think at the end of the day, if we can continue to keep asking the question, you know, let's employ, you know, there's so many people out there with all abilities that don't have a job or don't have a purpose. So, what we're trying to do very, very um, purposeful is to inspire more people to go, why not? Why can't yeah. we create jobs? Why can't we actually partner with great companies? Why can't we actually get people to actually get excited about coming to work? So that's something that's driven really, um, really closely to my heart. And hopefully we're doing a good thing. I, I, well, I know we are doing a good thing. We've yeah. still got a long way to go, but you know, like today's opportunity to talk to all of you, I think, um, you know, hopefully you've learned one or two new things that you might not have and made you, made you think a little bit differently. And I think as human beings and as business leaders, if we continue to ask the question, you know, let's not be satisfied with what we've got now, let's ask the question on how we can become greater. And that could be through a conversation or watching a movie or linking up with somebody else. But before you know it, um, those conversations can lead into really great partnerships. So thank you very much, Tony. Now, um, I just want to uh, um, give everyone a bit of an update. We've, we've had, um, unfortunately, a couple of people who were running breakout rooms had to pull out for um, different personal reasons, sick children and that sort of stuff. So um, I have been sort of, you know, figuring out what the best way to run this is because we did have some breakout rooms selected where a lot of people were wanting to go into a session that is no longer available. So I thought before we before we wrap up, rather than go into breakout rooms and sort of have to reallocate people, um, what we might just do is throw the floor open to general questions just to sort of give you some idea for all the participants. We have people here um, who are experts in, in fundraising, much like Tim with the raffles, but also Nigel who... Um, who's an ex-CEO of uh, a major not-for-profit who um, uh, can talk about uh, how, how to frame fundraising through social purpose lens. And we've got um, Melissa and Joanne who can answer any questions you may have around um, HR issues, whether it's uh, about the cultural fit or uh, workplace bullying, uh, how to deal with the hybrid workplace. So um, rather than go into breakout rooms, it, it's um, a smaller group now because we've had a few people um, had to leave and make their excuses. So um, does anyone have any questions in general about um, issues that they're having within their um, organisation that they'd like to troubleshoot? Tristan, I might, sorry to take the microphone again, but I just might put this question to Joanna and, and Melissa, I guess in that space of the the HR space, which is, I think, becoming so um, such an important space for organisations. What have you? What are you both seeing at the moment that is the biggest challenge for your areas? Um, and I guess going forward for organisations, what are some of the steps that you think that companies need to do to continue to make sure that we keep we're keeping the great staff? Because the way that the world's changing so quickly. Um, if you lose great staff, you know, that training purposes is so expensive. Um, just wanted to throw that out there to see if, uh, what your thoughts were on that. Did you want to go, Joanne, or would you like me to? Okay, awesome. Um, that's a, a one of the million-dollar questions at the moment. So if you could ask anyone... Um, a headache in business, if everything's going okay, the one thing that'll keep them up will be people. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, any Anyone dealing in business, especially business owners, um, it'll be, it's not just my mortgage, it's everyone else's mortgage as well. Um, but there, it's the rapidness of change that I'm finding is the biggest issue. So not only um, that hybrid workplace, so um, dealing with 
what's going to work best for for the business, then the retention of the good staff is is exactly as I mentioned around that um, that great resignation, which I think is an absolutely golden moment for for your business, which I really want to try and leverage, uh, Tony. So we'll definitely be catching up, yeah. but it all actually comes back to us the why, but it's it's what I call a strategic action model. So it's actually knowing what your strategy is. So it's almost like an axie like this, which is knowing what you you need to do, how you need to do it, um, and being really clear around the why, but also what are the processes and systems to help us achieve our why, and then activity, which is the sort of horizontal axes. And that particular axis is people. So a lot of the time when businesses measure, so uh, Tim, you, measured, you mentioned how much... Um, Figures are so important for business. For me, my passion is actually the people figure. So it's not about numbers as in the number of people, headcount, those sorts of things. What it actually comes back to is what are your people's experience within the workplace because that is what links directly to retention. A lot of people will call it engagement. So um, the key is finding the link and where's the gap between your strategy and your action And how are you going to um, fix that gap? Um, And some businesses only talk to the staff, but the approach that I take is actually talking to the business owner as well or the leaders in the business to understand what their perception or their experience in the business is and where's that gap and how do we bridge it? Um, Because retention is an individual voice, whereas engagement is a collective voice. So it's really important that people actually start having conversations as a whole, but also on the individual, because you can't just have, which comes back to your why, is that, and I love that always, always, is you can't actually have a one-size-fits-all organisation. You have to actually start having solutions that fit the strategy, so that will look different for each employee. So it's actually knowing how to actually do that um, and formulating and understanding what is your unique um, perspective. So that's what I find. But that, let me tell you, that's nothing new. That has been a forever yeah. problem is that misalignment. So that alignment gap is a consistent issue and has been for the last 20 years that I've been doing this. Yeah. Thanks, Mel. Joanne, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that um, that uh, perspective? I think I would say... Um, no amount of money will keep anyone in a job. That's that's a given. Passion, commitment will keep someone in a job, even if they're not paid well. <laughs> you know, they'll find some way around it. Um, so finding your why and finding the alignment with the business's why is, is, I think, key. And that's why I practice what I call culture fit recruitment. So a lot of my recruitment is um, first a discussion with the business owners about what they want, what they think they need, Um, and then a a really deep dive into the candidates, where they are and what they want. I think that one of the biggest changes that has happened since COVID is that business models are shifting and and candidates understand that there is um, flexibility available to them now in different different workplaces, um, and they want to take advantage of that because their 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 um, goals are shifting. So they want more family time. They want less, you know, <laughs> travel time. They might want um, more, you know, more um, passion fulfilling work. So they're shifting. This great resignation is more a great shift in what people are are, are wanting from their work. Um, and so I, I would say my job, what I do, is uh, the most impo- important part about what I do is actually helping people discover their why because there's no bad employee or bad employer. There's just the wrong fit for me. Um, So talking about the why and helping people find strategies as to investigate and find out what their why is because a lot of people don't even understand really how to find their why. Um, So that's why I said to you before, Tony, any tips or tricks, anything that's worked for you, you know? and I, I think, you know, that that's a really important thing for employers, especially in this space, um, to find out how their why or the, the, 
the, the business's why um, aligns with their employees' why, and 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 if that's a match, really. So just just thank you so much, Joe and uh, Melissa, for giving your perspectives on that. And I think you're absolutely on the money. Just uh, because we're close to time, some people may be able to stay for a little while. Some people may need to leave. I've just shared a screen where it would be really valuable if you're able to just give us some, some feedback. So if you um, basically scan that QR code, you'll be able to then leave some uh, leave some comments. Just a couple of quick questions so that we can. Um, keep improving the sessions. Um, we always get great feedback about the valuable contribution that it's making um, to the sector because of the brilliant speakers that we have donating their time to kindly come along. And uh, that includes Nigel Harris and Brett Perkins, who are experts in the field as well, who've come along prepared to run a breakout room. And unfortunately, we didn't go in that direction today because we, we had uh, a bit of a different format. But I really do appreciate every one of you for for participating in this forum. I, I, you know, it is amazingly valuable content that um, people can access for nothing other than, you know, the donation of their time. So I really do appreciate all of you for um, for the, the the efforts that you're putting in to make this, um, this whole forum work. And I did just want to comment on a couple of things. Um, so, you know, we're talking about purpose and we're talking about alignment in terms of recruitment as well as you know, driving your business forward. Um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, actually, I was at a, um, a retreat yesterday, a business coaching retreat for a couple of days, and the topic came up about recruitment and how it's getting more and more difficult um, and that it's it's so much not about money. It's about lifestyle. It's about balance between home commitments and work commitments. Um, you know, we had one guy who said he's got an excellent team of really loyal people because he lets them work there five day hours in four days and have a three day weekend and it's made all the difference. His people aren't going anywhere. They can be offered double the salary, but they want that extra day off. They don't have mortgages to pay. They've got families that they want to spend time with. So it really is a very complicated question about what it is that, you know, attracts and retains people. It's definitely not money. Um, and in terms of purpose, I mean, I know that, you know, we have been in business nearly five years and as a startup, there's plenty of ups and downs. And one of the things that's helped us to drive forward is, is that you know the membership of B1G1, um, which allows us to contribute every time we um, close business, um, send out a work order, and get get it back signed from people, um, and and having that purpose is is really critical. You know, we we touched on how do you define what your purpose is? How do you how do you actually um, derive that? And I think it's you know partly about what is the stuff that you would do for free you know what are the things that you would do if no one had to pay you or recognize you for it that's 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 one clue but i think it's also about what difference do you want to make how do, how would you like to be remembered at your eulogy you know what are the things that people would say that would make you feel proud to have been on this planet and that's probably you know a bit of a gloomy way of looking at it but at the same time it is inevitable and if you think about you know what legacy you want to leave i think it does really help to to give you some clarity around whether you're you know on purpose or currently kind of frittering time away. Um, but I did also just want to say that, you know, thank you to everybody who's come along. And as a result of doing so, just by turning up, um, we've been able to donate 5,840 days of drinking water to people who don't have access to it, which is a total of um, 16 years. Um, so, you know, it's it's a, a small gesture, but it is something that we want to do to to you know, to embed giving in our business because you know this is this is a sort of an adjunct to what we do in our commercial ventures. But it's it's really important to support the sector, to support the people who need it most. And my view in terms of having purpose as a business is that there's very little point in having a bucket of cash that you've made from a business if the planet can't support human life anymore. And we're heading down that path really quickly. And you know, it's a, it's a bit of a you know, a, a sort of a downer topic to talk about at the end. But it is really important that if you're in business, you should have a purpose. And that purpose should be to make the world a better place because we need that to happen now and tomorrow, not in five, 10 or 20 years time. So, um, yeah, that's that's my personal take on having an alignment of purpose with your business, that it's, it's absolutely essential because all the money in the world isn't going to save us from climate change and uh, and the vagaries of, uh, of, you know, having a, a planet that we can't live on. So thank you, everybody, for turning up. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Um, we do have, you know, some some experts in the field here. If you do have any things that you'd like to, 
to to um, ask or brainstorm, please please do raise your hand and, and go ahead. Well, just before I leave, I just wanted to sort of reflect just two seconds on Melissa and, and Joanne's comment about the, the great R. I can't even bring myself to say that word um, <laughs> for fear that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And every time we say it in the media or, or we're just convincing everybody that they need to respond to it. I did, I did attend a, uh, a, a, a function last week that replaced it with reflection. So if we think about the great reflection, this is what's going on. People are, are, are re-evaluating, you know, their, 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 their position and their, their circumstances. And that's what's driving outcomes. And I think as employers, if we, if we are conscious of that and, and touch then exactly on it's, it's the non-financial aspects that, that are equally important and maybe as, as business owners and providers, we don't often spend as much time, you know, working on how we can address that. And so, um, for me now, I, I just purposefully try and it's not correcting, but go actually don't think about it like that. Let's think about it. What's driving the R word and, and how do we how do we uh, avoid it? Because it seems like that, that, you know, out of the US there's already signs that it's happening. Right. So, you know, thankfully, this is going to be one of those areas where, where hopefully Australia lags, you know, a long way behind. But now I have to go, so I can't even. <laughs> Can't even uh, continue, but I, uh, uh, it's nice seeing you all again. So uh, next time. And if Thanks not so before, much Merry, for coming, Brett. If not before, Merry Christmas. Is it too early to say that? Have I just yeah, no, we, we won't be running one of these again until February. Um, we, um, you know, it's too hard to try and coordinate it in December. But, yes, thank you. And same to you, Brett, although I'm sure I'll speak to you in the meantime. Yeah, right on. Everybody. Um, Joe, you uh, wanted to say something. I, I, I just actually wanted to... Um, comment on that I, I think that when when you talk about resignation I, I think it's more about realignment like you said and i think that we should also encourage people who don't feel like they're aligned with wherever they are to to move on with the best wishes as well because what what they take with them is um is a very kind words if you can help if you can help realign them with some with another organization that can that that is a, is a better fit um you start to build an incredible network of um um good good faith and, and goodwill out there and I, I i just there are a lot of people that i have helped um out of jobs as well as into jobs um and that's that they have carried with them I, i've gotten so much more i mean if you want to talk about numbers tim i've gotten so much return work um, not in the way that they have jumped around, but in the way that they have recommended me on to other companies as someone who um, really does stand by what I, I do. So um, I think that we should think about maybe not uh, resignation is a bad thing. I think it's more an alignment, like a realignment. And I think that we should be really aware of, of how we think about people moving on, because also we're opening up the opportunity for the right people to come into our, our um, organisations as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just quickly on that, um, you know, we've had to um, identify that some people weren't a right cultural fit for the business. And, you know, it is about well, helping to find a place where they're going to be happier, too. It's it's very much about if someone doesn't work out, then there are other places where they will work out. And, and just making that abundantly clear and transitioning and, and helping as much as you can is 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 definitely hugely valuable. And um, Tony and Melissa, you both had comments to make. Unless I'm happy for you to go first if you want. Really quickly, exactly what Brett was saying, this isn't about, oh, my goodness, the, the sky's falling in. It's actually about understanding what are we, how do we work, what if that was alignment, um, and it all comes back to having the right conversations in business. So unless you're actually talking to people and connecting with them, really interesting when we look at how much time we spend interviewing people to into your business, we might even interview them as they lead their business, how often do we actually interview them while they're in our business? So it's actually understanding why someone not just joins your business, but why do they stay? Um, and I use a tool, back to what Tim's talking about, data, make the decisions based on the data in your business, not on what's happening in the US, not what's happening in um, Melbourne or Sydney, what is happening in your business and make the decisions based on that. The sky's not falling in, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Tony? 
Oh, look, I was just going to quickly say, Tristan, it's more of a, a bit of a, a thank you to you for putting this platform on and really great to hear so many great people around um, on this platform. I, I remember when your why, but why you set up the impact place and um, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank you for following through and, and all the hard work you've done to make this happen because um, it's opportunities like this where we can put like-minded people in a room and um, and like Melissa said, you never know where that next conversation is going to come. So uh, I just want to say personally thank you for today and um, it was great to connect up with everyone. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to all of you again, because it is without you, you know, I don't have any content to share. I don't have anything to uh, to tell people other than, you know, our own messaging about, you know, the the Microsoft tech stack. And much as it's important, it's, it's going to get very dull every time. <laughs> so I really do appreciate you all donating your time and energy to this. And, um, you know, we're always striving to get more and more people along. It's difficult when you're starting off and you're just another commitment in people's calendars you know we're refining the messaging we're um running social media campaigns we're making phone calls to try and get people along and of course you know the middle of the day in some ways is not ideal because other stuff comes up but um you know so we're, we're, we're sort of always working to try and improve it but yeah i really do appreciate you all especially nigel who's gone above and beyond this time for actually turning up while he's on holiday so um and going to find a quiet space and we didn't even get him to be to to run a breakout room today so um I do really appreciate you uh, going above and beyond, Nigel. That was um, very, very good of you indeed. Um, and Yoli, you had your hand up for, do you want to say something? Um, I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, and I think it's also important to recognise not-for-profit organisations are also experiencing these issues uh, where People tend to think that because they're involved in a purpose-driven organisation, that their why is connected well with the why of their organisation. And sometimes there can be a cross-purposes with that as well. And that, um, you know, uh, I think that we have to remember, and I love what you said, Melissa, about the retention and engagement, or retention as individual and engagement as collective. Because what can happen sometimes in not-for-profits is that we forget that we need to still have that wonderful match of the employee with the organisation, just like you're experiencing, Tony, with Multicap. And sometimes that doesn't happen. When I've coached some not-for-profit organisations, there are some people that really did, don't need to be in that organisation where they actually need to be somewhere else because they, uh, there is a cross-fit. And I think sometimes we forget that because a not-for-profit is for purpose, that everybody's got the same why, and that's not necessarily the case. Great point, Jolly. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, I think so. Look, um, uh, unless anyone else got, got any closing remarks, I think we'll wrap it up there. I, I do, once again, thank you all for participating, donating your time. And, um, you know, we'll be picking this up again in February, um, running it over the silly season. It's hard enough to get people to turn up during all ordinary working time. 